What's going on guys, we're going to go over a session that I just played this morning. But first, what is the reason that people don't achieve their poker goals? What is the thing they could be doing that's extremely simple that will unlock the secrets of winning poker? It's incredibly easy. It's not some deeply buried, complex, convoluted thing that you have to be like a mastermind, genius poker player to understand. Not at all. The simple truth is that this has been a dreadfully taught subject for the best part of 20 years. While there is some good content out there, and obviously I think my own content is good and I spent a long time trying to make it rigorous, academic, procedural, comprehensive, all of that, I think there's very little content like that out there. And most of the content that you come across is kind of jumping around all over the place and really lacks the core secret of what it takes to win. And that core secret, as we're going to see today, is being able to compare the expected value, or the EV if you will, of your options. So many people play on autopilot. So many people just do what they've always done. They copy solvers, they copy other poker players, friends, peers. There's all this group think. The other day I met a student for the first time, a new private student, and he said, I'm in this group of really nitty players that just tell me to fold all the time. I said, do they tell you to fold always when you face a river bet? He said, yes. This is disastrous. Blind leading blind, you know, guys? Like This is absolutely an epidemic of a lack of structure, a lack of leadership in the educational side of the game. That's what we're trying to do here. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you guys what it actually takes to have good poker thinking because there's so much bad thinking out there. And I feel passionately about this. And I hope I can illustrate this key and often missed idea of comparing two options, sometimes more than two, but usually two options in this session. Let's get into it. Let me take you through my inner thoughts and show you how to do this using this 200 Zoom session as the training material. Let's go. So this first hand is actually a great example of where brain dead pattern copying parrot learning runs rampant. So we three bet 10 nine of clubs here in the big blind against the button. This is a really standard thing to do. You can also call and there's not a great deal of decision to be made pre-flop. Either play is fine, but you want to three bet this a lot. And we decide to call the four bet because when we compare the options of call and fold there, which I think are the only reasonable options, fold is going to be worse because the pot odds are just so good. The hand is so live. It's in great shape against many of villains' value four bets, like Ace King. It's also in great shape against many of the bluff four bets, like King Jack Offsuit, or possibly something like Ace Four Suited. When I say great shape, I don't mean it's like a favorite, it just has a lot of equity. So for these pot odds, you know, we need to get back about a quarter of the new pot that's going to form when we call, get back 12 out of 50.5, you know, that's about 25% of the pot. I think we can achieve that even out of position, though of course we'll take the worst of it here. But yeah, pretty simple call, don't want to be folding this spot. This is where I think people switch off. If you actually do a bit of hand reading, which is definitely a lost art, it's been described as a lost art before, not just by me, but by others as well. When we face this, you can see my mouse gravitates right to the fold button, not the call button. Most of you will gravitate towards the call button. Maybe not all of you. That's maybe a little bit harsh, but many of you will go to this call button. And why is that? It's because you're facing quarter pot and you have a pair. And normally when you have a pair on the board, even if it's third pair and you face a really small c-bet, you should call that c-bet. And when you take that paradigmatic, I recognize vaguely this spot before in some other form, and therefore I'm going to copy what I remember from that. When you do that, or you just switch off and go third pair, call one full turn, I think you make a mistake. I think you make quite a big mistake, because to call quarter pot here, you're going to need 20% pot entitlement EV. And it's not the same thing as saying 20% equity, because if you only had 20% equity, you would never want to call here because you would not realize anywhere near that much equity. So if you think about your opponent's range, all of their value four bets are smashing the shit out of your hand here. Every single one of them is destroying you. Many, if not all, of villain's bluff four bets are doing the same thing. The only thing you're winning against here, because remember, a solid, reasonable player, and most of these people are if they're not fish, they're going to have basically King X as their bluff. They're going to have a premium blocker. An ace has hit a pair. King X is the only heir. King 5, King 6, King 7. These are the only things you're ahead of. And when you call with this hand, hoping, targeting, God forbid, making some horrible robotic thought process about how you could have King X and how you've got 10X, you realize almost no equity because people who are good at poker or even remotely competent understand that this board is really, really, really good for them as a four better. And they're going to keep applying pressure. They're going to barrel turns. They're going to triple. It's going to be an absolute nightmare trying to get the showdown. Another difference between this spot and other spots where you have third pair and want to call on the flop to a small bet is that usually when you have third pair in a single raise pot on jack five three and you've got queen three or something, you can hit the queen and be super stoked about it. Here, if you hit the nine... It's not even very good. It's pretty bad. Okay, it's better than not hitting the 9, but it's pretty bad. 
the reverse implied odds are through the roof. This is the spot where when you compare the EV of call to fold, you say, well, fold is zero. Call, I need to get back 20% of this pot in real life. You know, that means that the amount of chips I am due here, the EV of my call, needs to be equal to 20% of the new pot that's created upon me calling. Basically 12 into 60. That's going to be tough. I just realized I made a mistake in the math. This is quarter pot, not third pot. It's 17% you need. But you still don't have that 17% pot share EV, not 20 Look at the comment section, see how many people have paused the video, made that comment, unpaused it, and then been like, oh shit, he corrected himself. Probably a lot. So we fold. Really happy with this fold. I think it's one you've just got to make. The hand is trash in this situation. If you don't look at EV, you know, if you don't compare options, you're going to miss it. You're going to hit call there accidentally and it's going to be costly. Every little nitty gritty spot that comes up today that I think is important for comparing EV, I'm going to show you how to do it because this is the winning poker recipe. This is what you need to get better at. Here we open pocket nines, we get called by two weaker players. Like I say, it's a very polarized pool. There are some players that are really weak in this pool. There are some players that are really strong. There aren't that many in between. So here we have two really weak players because of stack size. We can just tell that. Don't be offended if you play non-full stack. You are a weak player right now, probably. Unless you're a professional short stacker. But that's okay, you can get better. We go fifth pot. Why do we do this? Like, Why do we not just check? Check is kind of like the automatic line. Well, when we're comparing EV here, when you have a really good sense of what happens in theory, and that doesn't mean copying the GTO outlook, the GTO output. So many people are like, you don't need GTO to beat 24 on L, or what are you on about? What the actual hell are you talking about? What do you mean need GTO? Do you think that GTO is like this gun that you equip to your gun belt and pull out and shoot at people? Maybe if you're using real-time assistance and you're reading from a hand grid post-flop, that's what you're doing if you're cheating. If you're actually playing poker, then your game is nothing like GTO. Don't flatter yourself. You might be approximating it. It's nothing like it. There's a big difference between GTO and theory. So when I talk about theory, what I, what I actually mean, guys, is what is happening? What is the physics of poker? Why do certain things increase EV and decrease EV in certain spots? Why do certain parts of ranges derive more or less EV by taking certain lines? This sort of thing. Understanding the concepts, not the bad ones, like pot control, like targeting and all this shit I'm talking about this on twitter right now you know writing down some examples of bad poker concepts none of that but good solid objectively true poker concepts that's what we teach in the carrot poker school we have over 33 hours of academic style progressed lectures that go from a to z that are comprehensive on this on carrotcorner.com get your poker education the right way that's why i made that course right that's the whole mantra behind it that's the idea that's the ethos all of this rambling, this kind of meta rambling aside, if I just say I'm going to check because multiway, or I say I'm going to check for pot control, or I say one of these bad poker terms, I'm not comparing EV. I've not even asked about betting. I've not even said, could betting be better than checking? And for many people, they're like, I didn't bet because my bet size here is B33, and it's too big. And maybe it's a bit too big, but it's probably okay. But you're free. You can fly. You can do what you want. You can bet 10% of the pot if it's legal in big blinds here. It's not. But you can bet one big blind here if you want. So I bet 1.4. Why? A few reasons why I think this is better than checking. If I check, I think these random weaker players will just lead nonsensical hands sometimes and it will cause me to fold on many, many turns. And many of those worlds where I check and then fold to a random turn lead from a merged hand or from a strong hand or from a weak hand, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes that hand that's betting the turn is a hand that would have folded flop because it's like sixes that didn't want to call flop and now it's hit a set. Or maybe it's king queen that's hit a queen. Maybe it's just queen jack that's bluffing. So there's many, many nodes where that happens. Second reason why this is better than checking, in my opinion, is that if I go small like this, I gain a lot of very useful fold equity. When you're three way, the usefulness of your fold equity goes up. That's a poker physics concept. That is like an objective law of poker. That when you make two hands fold, instead of one, you have folded out more total equity you've gained a bigger amount of equity by going to winning the pot 100% of the time because you had less to start with. That denial bet is really important to understand it's more valuable three-way. Another reason, and it's a smaller reason, is that if I turn a nine, it's really cool to have made it to the turn and it's really cool to have hit that against weaker players and be able to value bet and win massive pots. Now, they're a bit bigger and easier to build given that I've bet the flop. So when you're against players who are likely to bet turn too much, who are likely to just like sort of bet randomly with middling hands in their range, because they don't have 
you know, the definition in their game. They don't have the education to avoid betting the middle of their range. We call that a polarization error in the Carrot Poker School video course. It's a very key thing to avoid from an early point in your poker development. Long story short, we bet, we pick up a call. The rest of the hand isn't that remarkable. But I think that that point right there, where we have the chance to compare the EV of betting and checking, is huge. On the turn, there's no reason to bet anymore. Villain's range is too strong, our equity is too low, it's not low enough to bluff. If we bet, we make a polarization error, we have an easy check. And when villain checks back, the same thing goes on the river. Check is much higher EV than bet on both the turn and the river, but on the flop, bet was higher EV than check. Villain shows queens, I take a note about it. Just because I want to be like, new year, new me, I'm going to be absolutely rigorous with my note taking and leave no observed thing unrecorded or something like that. But yeah, I hope that was useful. Let's do another spot. The sand is rather unremarkable, but I want to show you it because it's quite cool. I didn't know the player here, and so many people that I don't know I assume to be weaker players. They may not be. It's very possible that they are actually a good player, and you guys in chat and the comments are going to be like, Oh, well, well actually, Pete, um, AJ Oz is a very strong poker player, and he plays a 90k an hour, so uh, you're, you're stupid. And you can do that if you want. And I get it, you know something I don't know in your part that I don't know this guy or whatever. I don't know why you guys are like that, but some of you are. Most people I don't know at this time in the morning, where I do put in some volume on streams and stuff sometimes, tend to be weaker players. And even if he's not, here's the deal. If he's not a weaker player, I can bet this flop or check this flop with Jack-10. Theoretically, all of the chaotic things that are going on here, all of the physics of poker, evens out in theory that bet and check are the same thing. The G2 output will mix here with this hand. It'll often bet, but it won't always. So I choose to bet always. Because I'm not going to do something I believe is inferior some percentage of the time. I refuse to do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to wake up in the morning and stab myself in the face with a fork 15% of the time. Well, I only did it at a low frequency, so it's fine. I prefer not to, but I do it sometimes. I'm not going to do that. So why do I think when I do this crucial winning recipe, this EV comparison, the thing we do all the way through my courses, why do I think that that means that betting is better than checking? The reason is simple. And it's about three or fourfold. One, random players with random strategies lead the turn too much, too loose, too freely, if you will, too irresponsibly. But that's bad for me when I have Jack-10, yeah, because I have less double delayed C-bet or single delayed C-bet opportunities. That's to say I can't check back turn bet river or bet turn as often because I face the lead. Two, I love betting flop because it opens up triple branches on certain textures that are very overfolded. Triple barrel opportunities, double barrel opportunities, over bet opportunities all of that juicy stuff, and I don't really unlock those really cool branches unless I bet here. Thirdly, another thing I would say is that people don't raise the flop enough. So when I'm against an unknown with an unknown strategy, I know that if they're a good reg, bet and check are kind of hard to decipher which is better. But if it's a recreational player or a weaker player of some sort, bet is usually better. Therefore, I have a situation where bet is usually winning more than check is, but not always, and sometimes they're even. So it's like if one play is usually better than the other or often better than the other, why wouldn't I just always take that play? I should always take that play. I don't wake up in the morning and stab myself in the eyes with a fork 8% of the time because, oh, well, it's a low frequency of me doing this, so it's okay. No one does that. It's ridiculous. It is important to think what is likely best here or what could be best here against certain player types. And yeah, okay, it's an autopilot spot. I get it. You guys just want to range bet. You just want to like check instantly. You want to get to a more interesting situation. You don't think it matters. And you know what? Against a strong balanced player with like a close to equilibrium strategy, who's pretty rare actually, but against them, it probably doesn't matter whether you better check flop. And against someone who believes your C-bets are full of shit and loves raising, it's important that you check flop. And against someone that's a massive net and just folds sevens here, it's important that you bet flop. But that aside, against pool, greater pool, recreational side of pool is better to bet than check. I'm highly confident. And if you get that right every time, Gonna quote Phil Galfond. He's been doing some stuff on YouTube that people have been telling me about. And one of the things he said recently is that every time you're in a spot, a paraphrase here, not quote, you have the chance to do the right thing. I think this is so key. And in the next video, I'm gonna be talking more about this idea of doing the right thing. But yeah, this is very much what we're talking about there. Let's do another spot. Here's another secret. The weirder the spot gets and the further you go from the base of the trunk of the game tree, 
So the trunk of the game tree is like the pre-flop action, if you will, or the flop. And the base of the trunk of the game tree in this metaphor is kind of like the first decision. Like, do I open 8-4 off under the gun? No. Simple, people all get it right. People all adhere to GTO. In that instance, most people have the similar hijack opening range or small blind 3-bit range against button. But as you explore outward into more and more branches and you reach like the thin little twigs and leaves and buds, fibres on the end of the stems of things, you reach the extremities of the tree as it were, it's just chaos. It's no man's land. Nobody is playing like a solver. So when people are like, oh, do you need GTO to beat 50 or L? What, you asking me if you should copy a solver snapshot in your game? No, 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 you shouldn't. Definitely not. The solver sucks. Solver's awful at poker in real life because it doesn't know what anyone's doing. It can't hand read at all. It has no capacity to hand read. So that's pretty bad. So let's hand read. Let's compare actions here. We 3-bet queen, jack of clubs, 3-bet pot, button versus cutoff, filling calls. We're kind of far from the base of the tree already because this is a spot where if you haven't studied these two ranges on this texture, you're going to be a bit lost. So already you can expect to see people play differently from the GTO output. Not everyone is just playing like a silver, even in a game with some tough regs. Even in the highest game running on PokerStars in this sad year of 2023, that's still not the case. Okay. There are other games running, by the way. Don't worry, you can still reach end boss level of the computer game. You just can't do it in Zoom anymore. So we see bet big here because this is a board you want to see bet at high frequency. And a big sizing is pretty good. You can also use a small sizing. Just because the solver says you should do X doesn't mean Y is not also feasible. So theoretically, either is fine. I go for a big bet because I think it's better. I think these days, decent regs have faced way too many small bets over the last few years. They've become more familiar with those. They know how to handle them. So a priori, we have an argument that big bet could be better just based on that lack of familiarity that a reg has with it compared to the small bet. Makes sense. If you haven't seen something as much, you're more liable to make mistakes on that node. Villain goes ahead and raises us. Hmm. When people raise here, obviously they're going to have 9s, 10s, 4s sometimes. They're going to have 10-9 suited. They're going to have ace 10. They're maybe going to have jacks if they don't 4 bet pre, but that's kind of rare. And other than that, they're going to have bluffs like gut shots, king, queen, maybe some 7 8 if they flat it pre queen, jack, diamonds, etc. So we have two choices we can call because we have an open end straight draw back to our flush draw and have enough pot share EV. Talk about this in grade one, lecture five. The pot share EV you need to call is a function of not just your equity when you're comparing EV of call and fold. You don't just think about equity. The fallacy of we don't have the odds. Do you know how many experienced poker players I hear saying we don't have the equity? It's not just about equity. It's about implied odds. It's about future fold equity. It's about what happens later on in the game tree and being able to predict that and understand it. That's what being good at poker is, guys. I'm taking a really borderline pissed off tone today because enough is enough with the shit thought processes, guys. Let's start comparing EV. When we consider jam, my first thought is that we are in dreadful shape against flush draws and flush draws will call it off. All of villain's value range is calling it off against jam almost always. There are no hands like 9x raise folding here, right? That's not a thing that this player is going to be doing. I think this player is a reg. So if this player is like much weaker, maybe that's a thing, but not here. And then my main thought was just that against most of villain's range, I just get it in in bad shape. I just like put it in. I'm a fairly big dog. Yeah, okay, it's not horrible to jam, like, it's better than folding. Jam is far better than folding, like, by an absolute country mile, but that's kind of irrelevant. I think call is the best play, because when we call, many of the weak draws, like king-queen and stuff like that, king-jack, 7-6, they're just going to give up. And many of the hands that are value are going to give us some realisation as well. They're going to check, maybe the turn will be good for a range, it'll be like, I don't know, an ace or something, which doesn't seem very good for... Well, maybe it's okay, actually, with not flushed off of the, the razor here, but yeah. So there's many branches where call just outperforms jam. I think if I thought there was more likelihood that people were raising to this size against a big flop bet with, like, king, queen, and queen, jack, and 7, 8, then I would definitely consider jam here, but I don't think that's happening. I think that's undercooked, and I think there are too many two-pair sets and flush draws in this range, and therefore I think in terms of true EV, true EV, the real EV, not what the solver says, not what your neighbor said, not what your friend in the study group that tells you never to fold the river said, but the true EV, the actual EV against your opponent's range, not in the chart. The chart's not true, it doesn't know anything, it's not magical. Just because things are mathematical and definite doesn't make them right, doesn't make them applicable to the real world. We want to call here. I think call is much better than fold and raise. 
villain then jams the turn and this is a pretty simple spot where we need about 33% 35% equity no sorry we have 64 chips we need about 30% equity 32 31 something like that to call and we don't have that because we lose to bluffs most of them okay if he has 7 8 or something then we're crushing but yeah there's not enough of that for us to call sadly it's not as far off as you might think though so we fold here again comparing EV on the flop of our options it almost doesn't matter what the hand is you can always do this exercise and you can learn a lot from it you three bet ace king standard stuff guy calls six five three you can big bet you can check if i big bet how is villain going to react i think not too badly they may overfold a little bit but they're mainly folding worse hands if i check how is villain going to react i'm not so sure so this is a spot where a decent player is going to play in an okay way and i don't have a huge feeling about whether check is better than bet or bet is better than check but one thing i do know is that if i start betting if i bet big here and villain calls then my future decisions with this hand are unlikely to yield many mistakes from my opponent so if i bet here villain calls and the turn comes usually i check although you can barrel on some turn cards with this hand but i don't think there's that many branches in the future tree where i can gain an edge but if I check, I think people are going to bet a bit lopsided on this flop. I think they're going to bet too many pairs immediately. I don't think they're going to slow play enough pocket pair, because you're meant to sometimes. And I think they're going to check King Queen of Diamonds too much, because people underreact to texture. So if I bet, I really don't think there's a big exploit there. I don't think there's anything I can do, for the most part, to gain extra EV or exploit my opponent or beat my opponent. But if I check and he checks back, I think his range is too weak overall. Not always, some people will be really good here, they'll be really studied, but you've got to assume that people are making the mistakes that most people are making. So here, for example, is a phenomenal spot for Villain. Villain should be bluffing so many combos here. Queen Jack, King Queen, King Jack, it doesn't really matter. When you have a dominating grip on the board texture, when your range is kind of crushing, you can just do a lot of that pressure application, bluffing, whatever you want to call it. So we check again. But now that he's not bet flop, I'm kind of like, okay, do you have enough 4s, 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s? Do you have any sets? Do you have any flush draws? Or is your range lopsidedly skewed towards stuff I beat now? And I think it's the latter, guys. I really do. And against people that aren't really good, and that's most people, even in this game, I'm going to check call a turn and the river. And now I've unlocked an exploit. Because by choosing check over a bet on the flop, I went down a path where I thought my opponent could unbalance their range later. And this is what I mean trying to compare not just the street you're on because your EV is a function of the whole hand but trying to look ahead to the future nodes in the game tree. Villain checks, river clearly we have, I don't think we have a value bet although maybe betting like tiny I call this feathering in grade three of the carrot poker school betting like three BBs here. It's not to induce although if we do get raised I may well call because I'll be like hmm I think you've bet all your pairs earlier but I don't expect to get raised very often it's actually just a value bet so if I bet three here I'm just kind of saying, follow me with ace-queen, ace-jack, etc. You don't have enough of your pairs left. I could do that, but I think a better line actually is to check looking to bluff catch because I think people will get here with very, very few value bets. And that's going to mean they're over bluffing when they bet river. I'm going to do one more and then we're going to wrap this up and I hope this has been a useful recipe for you. I hope this has like opened your eyes to just how much your choices do matter in every spot. This weaker player men raised the small blind and then bet one big blind on the flop. What is this player doing? Open your eyes here, guys. Do you fold jack seven here? Let me formulate it this way. If you fold my hand in this spot, you have blundered. There are three types of mistake I use in my framework to teach students. There are inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders, just like on chess.com. For anyone that plays chess, I stole it from them. The reason it's a blunder to fold here is that this range is stupidly mal-constructed. Is that a word, mal-constructed? Misconstructed? It's really bad. On average, a weaker player here is just betting randomly. And the thing is, they might bet like all the combos of jack 10 of spades for the sizing, but then bet pot when they have sevens because they're like, oh no, the flush draw or whatever it may be, whatever weaker player logic. I'm not trying to assume exactly what this guy's thinking. So if you don't raise here, you blunder. You blunder if you don't raise here. This is just true. Okay, you could call, but then they realize a ton of equity when they're grossly overfolding the flop on this node. I think about 25% of you raise here, maybe 20, and the other 80% of you are throwing away tons of money by not raising. 4.3 to win 4.8 i need this to work like hardly ever because i also have equity i have backdoor i have live pair draws if they want to call ace king i have a jack quite a big card and over card to nines etc 
if you compare fold with raise here, and fold's absurd on the flop, it's stupidly bad. But if you compare fold with raise here, the fold is zero EV, and the raise is probably winning, I don't know, like 30% of the pot? It's like a couple of big blind swings, something like that. So no, it's not optional to raise the spot. It's not like, oh, I found a cool play. Look, I raised. It's like, oh, I, I did the only thing that's good by raising here. It really matters what you do. It really matters what you do. It doesn't matter that you fold it. I don't care. It's not the point. You can fold 40% of the time there and raise is better than fold. This red table, I'm going to move on to next time because I have another video. I changed the color of the felt for the next video. I wonder if there's a really cool hand I can show you though from the other orange table before we do that. I think there's one really cool hand. Okay, one more kind of mundane spot, but really awesome one where again, you have to do the right thing or you lose money. Queen three deuce, blind versus blind, we flat king jack off. Don't three bet king jack off here unless you know your opponent is like incapable of four betting because they're going to shove a lot and then they shove nines and you just like open the action with king jack off to fold. This is terrible. Think about pre-flop there. You can compare the EV of call and 3-bet. And if you have a 3-bet, you are like throwing away money, burning it into the ground. On the flop, villain quickly checks. What is his range? And what should you do? How do you make sense of the dilemma between betting and checking here? Pause the video, have a think. Okay, the answer is this. Betting is better than checking. The reason is that fold equity here, in game theory terms, is meant to be, let's say, well, let's look at the size I bet first, which is small which I think is the best sizing. The fold equity here is not really meant to be more than the break-even point. So when I bet third pot, villain should be folding about 25% of the time, calling 75% to make me indifferent if they're kind of doing that whole MDF, one of the trashiest poker terms ever, MDF. It's not totally useless, but it's badly used. But the MDF is 75% in the spot. And I think this is a spot where they should try to roughly follow that. Not always is that true though, which is why MDF is silly. There's only one of the reasons why it's silly, but I'll talk about that on Twitter. Characters one, follow me. I talk about a lot of these shit terms and try and save you from them. 1.7 into 5.7, about third pot. This range is probably so malconstructed, I'm going to use this word now forever, that I think the fold equity here is plus 50%. I think the fold equity here is double what it's meant to be. Do you know what you're meant to do when your fold equity is double what it's meant to be? Bet. When you have nothing, when you have air, bet. Because if you check, they may just go, oh, he checked, I bet now with my 8-9 of diamonds that I was folding. There are so many hands, villain is just auto-folding on this flop. If you don't bet here, the solver won't tell you to always bet. The solver will be like, okay, so you should probably bet like 16.9% of the time for this sizing. You should check 61% of the time and, 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 and it's going to do that. What an idiot. Can we just take a moment to appreciate how stupid the solver is against this player? how bad it is, there's a reason that it's been empirically shown that solvers have low win rates. They have low win rates in 6 max cash compared to regs, especially when you add weaker players to the pool. There are three blue tags on this table. Would I rather be an average reg or a solver? I'd rather be an average reg. I'd rather be some bozo reg who's half brain dead and not thinking and autopiloting because even that reg will exploit the fish better than the solver will, probably. Although he'll mess up some other spots and stuff too because he's not thinking. But yeah, I'd so much rather be like me in this spot than a solver, because solvers suck. So that's the little nitty gritty hand. There's a big pot I want to show you. Because it wouldn't be a Carrot Corner Poker Education video without me suffering and getting stacked and running bad. This happens on, on our videos, so we have to do that too. Oh, I run so bad. Oh, woe is me. Base 10, squeeze, high frequency squeeze. You could not squeeze. You could go smaller. I should go smaller. The stack is too small for the sizing to be optimal. I can go a little bit smaller and save some EV careless but whatever who cares this weaker player green is kind of like not horrible fish but kind of placid player that so far seems to lack any kind of energy or bravery shall we say so far seems to like playing a really snug game i could be wrong though could easily be wrong about that don't know the player that well we see bet flop in a squeezed pot small on king king eight fantastic board for range fold equity is through the roof Probably betting is better than checking for almost all hands because all hands pretty much gain useful fold equity. And this is not the type of fella that's going to start blasting at me when I check with queens. So I should just bet small with lots of stuff. So I bet quarter pot. On the turn, I bet third pot. This is the right sizing. It would be kind of like a tome of knowledge to go into right now to explain why. Carrot Poker School does all of that. But I don't want to get into it right now, but this is the right sizing. It's just better than any other sizing. And I think just always betting this hand is fine. You could check as well, but I just felt like bet was better. My opponent's probably overfolding. 
And on the river, I make the nut flush. And here, there's not much to think about. You have a passive player with a capped-ish range with loads of king x and pairs, and you've just made the nut flush. So shove is infinitely better than checking. Checking is like absolutely preposterous here. So we jam, and they snap call. And when this player with the green tag snap calls you, snowman's is kind of likely. We get Rosen out of the game by the snowmen. I sound like a 2003 World Series of Poker commentator. The snowman. The snowmen have got the carrot man here. That's gotta hurt. That's gotta hurt. Remember to like the video, leave a comment, and I'll see you on the next one. Snowmans. Bye for now, guys.